you post some interesting thoughts there, Binna, about uh, talent pools and high potential schemes. And of course, we at the National School often link our leadership development into those talent pools. Um, but moving on, really thinking about what you were saying earlier about the importance uh, the people you interviewed placed on mentors and um, how that linked into their development. Well, there's one person who never had a mentor, yeah. uh, and she, she, couldn't, she could never remember having had a mentor uh, throughout her career. So she kind of had people that she would always turn to at particular moments, yeah. but nobody that she would actually refer to as a mentor. But everybody else did have a mentor, uh, and they still had mentors. And that was a very significant theme in, um, in the interviews. Yeah. And they would turn to these mentors at times of uh, critical moments, times yeah. of crisis, or... Um, times of particular challenge mm -hmm. and the, the, the mentors would guide them through it. Yeah. Uh, the interesting thing is that they, the, the mentors um, weren't necessarily ones that were chosen uh, by the organisation because yeah. that's what's happening in organisation now, you, you must have a mentor. Yeah. These were people that, that they found around them yeah. and uh, they didn't necessarily have to be in work either. Uh, one, of the, one of the people who was um, chief, chief executive of a uh, financial services firm, his mentor was a priest. Mm. Completely different. And actually yeah. added, a, gave a dimension um, which he couldn't get from other people yeah. in the work setting. From my experience working with senior leaders, um, they often talk about this whole area of, of loneliness and, and where they get their support, um, which, which is linking into really what you're saying about the importance of, uh, of having that that mentor or trusted friend, if I can refer to it in that way. Um, but you also mentioned earlier on about um, the leaders you interviewed really seeing feedback and self-awareness as being quite important. You know, what, what were their thoughts on that? Well, feedback was important because it, it, ena it enabled people to keep their feet on the ground. Right. Uh, there was one chief executive I was talking to and he said that he had use of the company jet and they would just call it up, he'd get driven, Sherpa driven to the airport, climb the company jet and then fly wherever he had to go yeah. to. And he said there's no easier way just to uh, uh, increase your self-importance than by doing something like that. You're, you're, you're flying thousands of fa yeah. uh, feet um, you know, above, um, above the ground, you're looking at all the little people below, you're earning a big salary and it just inflates your ego. Yeah. And he stopped using it because uh, he said it, uh, it is really damaging uh, to, to oneself and the relationships then you have with other people, you can become very arrogant and, yeah. and uh, insulated. And start believing that, be, that you, you are uh, infallible. Yes, yeah. Um, but then connected with that was this the being in touch with their own values. So there was some there was a high degree of self-awareness amongst this population of people. Yeah. And, th and through the setbacks and experiences they had through their careers, they'd actually understand what their values were. And that would be a touchstone. Once they, once they were aware of what their values were, because sometimes it wasn't necessarily apparent, once they, be, they became a touchstone then for them throughout the rest of their careers. Yeah. Within the National School, I mean, we're really focused on, you know, top, uh, top leadership development. And it, actually one of the challenges, where do you focus that development on, you know, on the business angle, on the self-awareness that you were just talking about? I mean, what's your view on that? Well, no, knowing the business is one of the factors that yeah. came out. Uh, that wh whatever organisation you were in, you had to know what it did. Yeah. Uh, and you had to know it in detail. And you had to know how one part of the organisation connected with the other parts. Yeah. You had to understand those interconnections yeah. if you're going to do anything worthwhile with that organisation. Uh, and then... But that self, the self-awareness was actually almost as important, understanding what your values were, understanding what your strengths were, and understanding what your unique qualities are. That's almost as important as, uh, uh, well, I think it's probably more important, yeah. to be honest, as knowing what the business is, because actually having, having that understanding about yourself, that will stay with you. Yeah. Um, and you'll be able to interpret any situation, you'll be able to interpret your feelings, your emotions and responses to any given situation. Mm. And you can move from one organisation to another and you'll have to learn more knowledge. But yeah. That ability to be able to understand how you're operating at any given moment is something that is, it's a capacity that will never leave them. Yeah. From what you're saying is it's really strengthening the, uh, the notion that uh, particularly we find with senior leaders moving around both within uh, civil service and the wider public service and people coming in and the importance of that self-awareness 
and that whole area. Um, any other uh, thoughts around that area? It's, well, one of the things about the nature of leadership and the way it's changed, um, the one of the key things that, that came up during the course of the interviews is about how leadership has changed and how it's evolved. And people were saying it's kind of it's less hierarchical, there's far less deference. The, 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 um, it's, it's, more, it's more informal. I mean, you're still in charge, but yeah. the, the nature of the relationship you have with your people is, um, is, is it's not as uh, autocratic yeah. uh, as, it, as it previously was. So yeah. the way you communicate with people is, is critical. Yeah. And I think the other, the other thing that emerged was actually uh, displaying respect uh, for all those around you. Yes, Ben, I, I certainly, uh, I'm sure I and those others watching this will, will recognise the importance of respect and uh, the way that leadership is developing. Um, and are there any other areas that you think we should really um, be interested in taking account of? It's, I, don't, I don't have a specific action, but, but, but I think this research has posed uh, questions for me. Yeah. Um, and the questions would be, do, 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 like what I said earlier, do, do we overprotect? Um, high, high potentials yeah. and high flyers. Uh, do we expose them enough to to, uh, to difficult challenges? And do are we really assessing for the right qualities? Because a lot of the things that kind of emerged for me from the um, interviews that I've carried out is that there is a sense of kind of motivation and the, and the drivers that these individuals have and, the, and their early experiences, which we which are different from competences. Yeah. And these people are driven to kind of seek out challenges themselves, to look for opportunities. They, they understand their values. They seek feedback. Uh, they do d display respect for other people. They are open to, to um, listening and all of those other qualities. Yeah. Those aren't necessarily qualities that are displayed in um, competency frameworks. Yeah. Binner, I think um, you know the way that you've just summarised uh, your thoughts and, and the emerging findings, and uh, are much more energising to me and I'm sure others than you know often when we just read competence frameworks. And I think uh, it's a really good point uh, to end on and gives us lots of food for thought. Thank you very much. No, thank you very much. Thank you.